The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the Imaginary Lines. I'm your host, Michael Fox. What is freedom of expression and who is it for? This question is at the heart of a debate currently taking place in Ecuador. There, earlier this month, the Ecuadorian government announced that it would be requesting that the media watchdog NGO Fundamedios cease operations for deviating from its stated mission and continuously intervening in political matters. International groups, including Human Rights Watch and Freedom House, have criticized the decision. But Fundamedios has also received tens of thousands of dollars from U.S. aid and also the National Endowment for Democracy. I'll speak with Cheryl Martins. She's a head researcher at the University of the Americas in Quito, Ecuador, about Fundamedios and also Ecuador's two-year-old media law. But first, we're going to take a look at media and Latin America. <laughs> September 30th marks the five-year anniversary of a violent coup attempt in the South American country of Ecuador. President Rafael Correa was forced to seek refuge in a hospital after being physically injured by the police at a protest. Coup supporters captured the country's two main airports and shut down the state-owned television station. The president was held in the hospital for more than 12 hours. When he was rescued, his car faced a rain of bullets that killed a guard. A total of eight people were killed. Nevertheless, the coup was thwarted and that same night, Correa emerged on the balcony of the presidential palace in Quito to greet supporters. The corporate media, both in Ecuador and abroad, began a campaign to convince the world that the day's events did not count as a coup, but merely a rebellion by dissident police. Opponents of the Correa government said it was all staged in order to garner support for Correa. Others blamed the president himself. The same was said of the 2002 coup against Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez, the 2009 coup against Manuel Zelaya in Honduras, and the 2010 ouster of Fernando Lugo in Paraguay. This is the strategy. So doubt in the minds of the people about events that should be clear-cut. You don't need to convince everyone. You just need to create the impression that there are two sides of the issue, even in the face of overwhelming evidence. The International Business Times said Ecuador's decision to dissolve Fundamedios had created a worldwide, quote, backlash over free speech. And the Miami Herald ran the headline, after taking aim at media, Ecuador goes after a free speech organization. But the issue is complicated. Since its founding in 2007, the same year Rafael Correa came to power, Fundamedios has received tens of thousands of dollars from U.S. aid and the National Endowment for Democracy, two U.S. government institutions that have been accused of funding opposition groups in Latin America. In WikiLeaks cables from September 2009, then U.S. Ambassador to Ecuador Heather Hodges highlighted connections between the group and its director Cesar Ricarte and the U.S. Embassy. The news on Fundamedios comes two years after the passage of Ecuador's new media law, which created media regulatory bodies in Ecuador, mandated outlets to report news accurately, and moved to democratize Ecuador's media by opening up one-third of the airwaves to community media. At the root of all of this is the larger question of who controls the airwaves corporate media, or the people. Cheryl Martins is a head investigator at the University of the Americas in Quito, Ecuador. She's also the co-author of International Political Economy of Communication, Media and Power in South America. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Mm, thanks. Great to be here. Cheryl, I want to get right into it. Um, who is Fundamedios? What do they do? And why has the Ecuadorian government uh, ask them to cease operations here in Ecuador? Well, um, Fundamedios um, uh, is, is a group of uh, journalists um, who um, started a foundation. They have um, been operating here in, in Ecuador uh, for the past uh, several years. They have been asked uh, by the government to cease operations um, because uh, on the one hand, uh, the government states that they are not following their own um, internal um, uh, constitution in terms of um, n not being partisan. 
And uh, as a result, um, this involvement in politics is something that uh, the Korea government uh, has not uh, taken uh, very lightly. And uh, if you look at it, really, I, I think that at the heart of this, it's not just about, about that fine detail, but it's also about um, wider developmental issues, I would say, uh, in the region. And, and for that reason, um, you know, we can see if we look at uh, the funding that Fundo Medias has received, um, a lot of it has come from USAID and uh, more recently from third parties. And that funding uh, has been very much funding that's been earmarked uh, for uh, democracy projects uh, uh, from the United States. And so for, um, that kind of um, operation, I think, which is behind uh, a lot of the, the, um, the funding uh, for Fund the Medias has, has also uh, received great critique by the government. And when you say kind of democracy funding, you mean kind of opposition, pro-democracy, kind of U.S.? Yes, like Voice of America. Um, you know, we can see that in, um, in other places where the government uh, in the United States is not, is not completely in, in agreement with the, the, the policies, for example, you know, whether it be here in South America or in, in Asia. So obviously this has kind of raised, uh, the reactions to this have been very kind of controversial. You've had Human Rights Watch um, and Freedom House have come out obviously against uh, the Ecuadorian government. And then at the same time, you've had uh, the Federation of Journalists of Ecuador that have also come out kind of in favor of this request to cease operations or to ask um, from the mayors to cease operations. What's your analysis of kind of the reaction, but also this kind of this development? Well, um, again, I, for me, it's very uh, intimately related with um, the conflict uh, over uh, approaches to development, approaches to the way in which people understand um, development and, and what is progress, uh, what is democracy. These are, are, are really at the, at the core of, of this, this debate and this is why Fundamedios is, is a very good uh, case to look at because uh, we can see that we've got, um, on, the, on the one hand, we've got um, private um, media uh, talking very much about freedom of expression, uh, but whose freedom of expression are we talking about? The freedom for you know the, uh, private media to um, promote corporate interests. These are the things that, um, on the one hand, you know the governments are you know trying to um, take new structural approaches, um, and and these approaches are not necessarily. Um, very complementary to some of the the corporate uh, agendas that w that we have right now in the region, so I think that uh, is is really something that's very much behind, um, you know, where this conflict is 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 coming in. And then here in Ecuador, we've got a, a real, you know, a conflict over and uh, you know, fight for public opinion as uh, as uh, the chapter by Mauro Serbino. Uh, and his colleagues uh, makes very clear uh, there's a, a fight over public opinion on the one hand by the media, uh, corporate media, and on the other hand by by the government as well. Now, what's interesting in terms of the the case of of Ecuador and the um, uh, media law is that we have the spectrum divided in three. But until now, the um, Corporate media and the government have very much center stage, and the third that's supposed to go to um, community media, um, which would really help with the plurality of voices that we need in terms of the democratization of, of media, that is, is still something very much under development, uh, is something that, that um, really hasn't, hasn't um, come out uh, in a way that people were expecting. I'm glad you brought up the, the media law, because that's kind of the direction I wanted to head mm -hmm. into. Obviously, it's been around for about two years. Can mm -hmm. you talk briefly about what does it mean, what's the reality on the ground, and why has there been such a backlash mm -hmm. against it? Well, the uh, communication law here in Ecuador um, uh, is, is similar um, in, in several ways to the media laws and, um, that have been passed um, since 2000 in Venezuela, in Argentina in 2009, uh, Bolivia. Um, really looking to address the, the, the issue of, of corporate power in media. 
And uh, what's interesting in the case of the Ecuadorian law and, and also very progressive um, when we look at it uh, from, uh, from other countries is that we have um, the, 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 the spectrum divided in, into three. Uh, and, and in the case of Ecuador, uh, one more percent, so a third for uh, corporate, a third for government, and a third for uh, community media, plus one percent. And is this the, the television and radio waves, or when you say the spectrum, what, what part of this? Yes, yeah. Uh, and so uh, as a result, um, we are still in the um, process of trying to develop the um, uh, well, I would say we can see that the government is, is still uh, trying to Im implement the um, community uh, uh, division of the, 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 the spectrum for the community media. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's difficult. Um, you know, there's been a lot of um, backlash from corporate media especially. Um, but what is different in the case of the Ecuadorian communication law is that it, it gets into content in a way that the Argentinian um, law of 2009, the audiovisual law, d does not get into. And so this is where you see that a lot of people um, are also um, criticizing the media law, and, and that's another reason for the backlash. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> I think that's an important question, and it mm -hmm. kind of begs what you mentioned earlier about freedom of expression, mm -hmm. freedom of speech. Um, and you were talking about how uh, the freedom of expression and speech is interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Because in the United States, it's kind of usually visioned, or, or in the North, the global North, she was saying, well, freedom of speech is freedom of speech. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outlet to be able to report what they want to. What are, what, are the, what are these differences here? What are we talking about? Well, I think the whole thing, you know, it, it comes down to the way in which, uh, and who's freedom to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So the way in which we understand what is freedom, right? Because uh, it's all fine and good to say, well, we will have freedom of speech, but the only people that can afford to, to have uh, television stations are, are very wealthy. Uh, the idea here uh, in, in South America has been to try to make media more available to um, the, the masses. And so this is the reason for in the, the expansion of community media and the desire to promote community media. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much yeah, for joining me in Imagine Your Life. Nice to be with you. Thank you. And now to the United States for the latest from the presidential campaign of Bernie Sanders. The race to choose the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party is heating up, and the two frontrunners, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, have now begun taking shots at each other after largely refraining from direct attacks. Earlier this month, a pro-Clinton super PAC fundraising group known as Correct the Record went after Sanders for his support for a program that provides discounted home eating oil for low-income communities. The program, however, was launched by the late Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. Sanders struck back, but his choice of words caused a commotion. In an email to supporters, Sanders, a self-described socialist, said Clinton supporters tried to link me to a, quote, dead communist dictator, referring to Chavez. Bernie Sanders has made headlines as a result of the enthusiasm his campaign has generated. But this episode serves to highlight just how easy principles and respect can be discarded in U.S. politics. The Sanders campaign likely calculated that they could get away with calling Chavez a dictator. The Venezuelan president was regularly demonized in U.S. media, despite the fact that he received widespread approval at the ballot box time and time again, and elections were consistently celebrated as free and fair. Chavez was democratically elected five times, and during his time in office, more than 12 referendums and local, regional, and national elections were held. It seems that in the United States, political figures have no choice but to support foreign policy hawkish positions, vilifying leaders like Chavez. But if Sanders really wants to end politics as usual, as he so often claims, then he shouldn't toe the line, reproducing misinformation regardless of how acceptable those lies are in the mainstream media. And that's it for today's program. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Please join me next week.